The book presents a few different ideas about how to identify art. I want to go over all of them because they can get a little confusing. So the first way the authors claim they want us to identify art is conceptually. I call this one the ugly. Think about what it means to do something conceptually. It's based on facts, on concepts, on things we just kind of know. This is actually a really bad way to identify something as art. We need to look at it, but I wouldn't use this if I were you unless you really want to identify with this method. Now, the first conceptual criteria is to look at whether or not the work was made by an artist or at least man-made. The problem with requiring something to be made by an artist is that you don't always know if someone is an artist, who the artist supposedly is, or what an artist actually is. An artist makes art. Anything with the same words in the definition that are in the word, probably not a good definition. Secondly, if we rely on something being man-made to be art, we, we kind of rule out nature. We don't know if nature came from a big bang from God or where it came from. I take pictures every time I see a rainbow because they make me happy. I think they're art. Well, not according to this criteria. Already, this definition is scoring an F, F, F minus. Now, the second conceptual criteria is that the work is intended to be art. Intent means that you meant to do it. Are you a side of the paper doodler when you're taking notes in class? Has anyone ever told you that your little doodles were just something that you were doing because you were bored, but they thought they were really cool? Or they told you you were a great artist, but you didn't intend for the drawing to be art? This also fails because sometimes things just happen. Coco the gorilla, you know, the, the one that could do sign language, also painted. Do you think that Coco meant to do that and to make her paintings art? Coco also fails the criteria because she wasn't a person. She fails criteria too because who knows what she was thinking? I certainly don't. Now, the third conceptual criteria is that the work is recognized as art. Now, raise your hand if you were alive in the 17th century and living in France. You're not raising your hand, and I can't see if you are. Because none of us were there, unless you believe in reincarnation, maybe. In 17th century France, art had a definition. We get to this later in the semester, so no pictures today. But today, art does not have a definition, so it doesn't need to be recognized by anyone in order to be art. If you like something, it's art to you. You don't need some critic to tell you that it's good. So the conceptual criteria, they're just that. They're conceptual. They're also kind of garbage. The whole set of ideas gets that F minus, 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 minus. There's no feeling, no individual thought. You're just checking off boxes. And that's not really a way to do anything here. Nothing more than feeling. Shirley Bassey very accurately depicts what I believe is the way to describe the perceptual approach, so approach number two to defining art. So the authors of the book also introduce this to us. Perceptual is supposed to be feeling-based, but this definition of art, it has almost nothing to do with feelings. So like the conceptual definition, the perceptual definition of art requires a piece to meet all three criteria to be art. According to me, this gets a C minus, minus, minus. First of all, it calls for a piece to be unique. Now here's the problem, what's unique? It's the only one in the world at the time. So maybe after the first painting was painted, all the others were no longer unique. Or does the unique come from the content? Look, it's a purple Lamborghini. That's unique, but they made more than one, didn't they? So it's not so unique anymore. The second perceptual criteria is that the work transcends. That means it continues to be important over time. Well, we still talk about the Beatles and their music has transcended time. You can still find it in iTunes and music stores and sometimes on the radio. But transcendence means something has to be old, doesn't it? 
So does that mean that Taylor Swift, Justin Timberlake, or even Justin Bieber, for that matter, won't know if they're really artists until their work transcends? That makes no sense. And the final perceptual criteria may be the most ridiculous. It states that the work also now has to be influential. How can you be influential if you don't transcend? Jean-Baptiste Lully was a composer in the 16th century. Have you heard from him? Or have you heard of him, rather? No, but you will by the end of the class. Now, what you don't know about him is that as one of the first composers of the classical style of music in history, he went on to influence all the other people you have heard of, like Beethoven and Mozart and maybe even Justin Bieber. Now, that's influence. But you can't have influence if no one knows who you are because you didn't transcend. So you see the problem here? C minus, minus, minus. I cannot go any higher with this one. So by now you're wondering to yourself, wow, we just discredited this whole book that Dr. Keefe had us read. And yeah, we did. But there's a little nugget in chapter two that is worth knowing about. It is the way to identify art in this class and in life. So if you're not paying attention, now is the time to pay attention. The way to identify art is through participation. Participation is not just about getting credit for raising your hand in class. I can't see you anyway. Participation is about getting lost in the work. So picture this. You're in the car. You're driving along. The windows are down. Favorite song is blaring. You stop at a light, not caring who's in the world is hearing your dreadful singing voice. You're belting out the chorus to Bohemian Rhapsody, God's Plan, or whatever you're listening to these days. That's participation. You're engaged. You're looking at the details. You're getting lost. You're asking questions about the work. I'd ask you to try it, but you're probably already doing it. I mean, who doesn't want to know why Drake only loves his bed and his mom? And why is he sorry? So this is the end of the video. You can move on to doing the assignment now. Uh, I hope this is a better explanation than the book managed to give you.